Thanks so much. It's wonderful to be with you all, and welcome to everyone joining us online right now. Uh, we love this church. Uh, Beth, my wife, and I uh, love this church, and all our four daughters uh, were born in this church, not literally in this church, but just down the road, and uh, it's such a joy uh, to be with you all. I want to speak today on the power of connection, the power of connection. You are made for connection with God. It's key to your purpose. It's how you discover and discern your destiny. And, and finding the right connection with God has the potential to hugely transform every aspect of your life and bring a whole new meaning and purpose and joy to your life. But we know that often in life, uh, we can miss connections. It's very easy to miss key connections. We can find ourselves feeling a bit dislocated or isolated, or disconnected. So how can we find a meaningful connection with God in our lives that might bear much fruit in every aspect of our lives? Because what if the most significant thing about your life this year wasn't an achievement you attained, or a status you secured, but a connection which you created? So we're going to look at this amazing passage in John 15, starting at verse 1. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You're already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you don't remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. The first thing we see in this passage is how important it is to get close to Jesus, get close to Jesus. Jesus says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. But if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. All true fruitfulness in life comes from proximity to Jesus. If you want to bear fruit, if you want to make a difference, wherever you've been positioned in life, wherever you have a measure of influence, whether it's in the workplace or in a boardroom or in a business or in a family or in a school or in a university or in your community, if you want to make a difference, if you want to bear fruit, you need to get close to Jesus. You need to be connected to the vine. He's the vine, we're the branches. And in a vine, the life force of the vine flows through the vine into the branches. And then without even trying, without even forcing it, just naturally, organically, the branches of the vine will bear fruit because they're connected to the vine. But sometimes we find that a little bit hard to understand and we're tempted to try and force things, to try and make things happen. It's true in every area. So at the time of the last financial crisis, my friend was working as an investment banker and they had a few challenges with some slightly less ethical deal structures. And so their human resources team said, we're going to change the culture. And so one morning, he went into the bank, and he pressed the button for the lift, and the lift opened. And there in big letters on the wall of the lift were the words, do the right thing. And then he went to the loo, and there on the wall, do the right thing. And he's like, oh. And, and, and he said, wow, they're really trying to change the culture. I said, is it working? He said, no. And I said, why not? He said, well, I've been inculcated, shaped, trained, incentivized for years, not necessarily to do the right thing, but to make the most money. And so now I'm just being told, do the right thing. But my heart, my life, everything I've learned, my muscle memory is structured in a different way. So he says, the risk is, it's just words. 
It's just wallpaper. It's not actually going to change anything on the inside. It can be true with our bodies as well. I've recently started going to the gym. Yeah, I know, I know. I know. It's almost impossible to tell. And, <laughs> but, but I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of an amateur, and so I'm always looking for tips. And there's a guy at our gym uh, called Joe. He's the biggest guy at our gym. He's from Texas. And he has arms the size of most people's legs. And, <laughs> and, and I said to him, Joe, have you got any tips for me? And he kind of looked me up and down, and he said, how many meals do you eat in a day? And I was like, I mean, in the UK, we have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Like, what, what are you doing in Texas? What? And he said, just three. And I was like, yeah, just three. And he's like, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I said, how many meals are you eating? I mean, what do you call them? What? And he said, oh, I have five or six meals a day. I was like, really? He said, yeah, if you're only having three, you're not really going to make the gains. I was like, oh. It's different. And then I, there's this other girl in our church called Olga. She's a, a personal trainer. And so I said, what's your top tip for me? And again, she looked at me and she said, how many hours sleep are you getting a night? And I was like, what? No, I mean like exercise, like wait. She said, no, no, how many hours sleep are you getting a night? I said, I don't know, like seven. She goes, not eight. I said, rarely. And she said, ah, yeah, it's going to be very hard for you to make gains. I was like, why? She said, because your body needs sleep to recover and the muscles need sleep to repair. She says, yeah. So I was like, oh. Now, I think you can take it too far. I think if you just eat six meals and sleep for eight hours, <laughs> might not end so well for you. Uh, but it was so interesting because I was starting at a place of external pressure on my body. I was, I was affecting kind of outputs. And how can I apply external pressure to change my body? They were focusing on inputs. How, how, might, how might your inputs shift something in the internal constitution of your body so that you might then bear outward Gains, you might then bear outward fruit. So I guess my question for you today, whether you've been here for many years or it's your very first time here today, whether you've been following online for, for many weeks or you've just stumbled across this on YouTube today, my question for you is not what fruit are you bearing in your life or how are you going to bear more fruit in your life or where are you going to bear more fruit in your life? My question for you is, how do you feel about Jesus? What does Jesus mean to you? Are you connected to him today? When I was 18, I studied with a girl called Becky. She was in my year. And you know there are like Christians, and then there are Christians. And she was a Christian. So she was, everyone knew about it. She was out. She was, everyone knew about it. She had all the merch. She was like, and she was in everyone's faces. And, and, and I, I didn't quite see, I had a little bit of faith, but I, I saw it as a personal, private, secret thing that I didn't have to tell anyone. And, uh, you know, in some ways, I viewed it very much as a life jacket, which was, you know, if you're on a plane, you have a life jacket under your seat. It's not in the way. No one needs to see it. But if there's a crisis, you can put it on. And that's kind of how I viewed faith. It's a handy life jacket, put it on. But most of the time, no need to put it on. And so she came up to me uh, one day after a class, and she said, Steve, can I have a word with you? And just in case someone asks you that question, uh, a good answer to that question is uh, when they say, can I have a word with you? You can say, no, thanks. I'm OK. And <laughs> it's much, much better. But I didn't, I didn't know that answer. So I said, yeah, sure, tell me. What, 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 what do you want to talk about? And she said, Stephen, you're never going to help anyone with your life if you keep your faith in a box. And she just walked off. <laughs> so rude. So rude. All the way home on the bus, I was like, who does she think she is? Like judgy, judgy Christian. Like, you know, never help any. I was like, what? You don't know anything about my life, judging me, saying I should live differently. You don't know who I am, Becky. You know, it's like... <laughs> but by the time I got home, I thought, yeah, she's probably right. <laughs> but here's the thing. She applied external pressure, but it didn't actually change me. I felt a bit more guilty for a few days, a few weeks, but nothing really changed in me. But then a few years later, I, the Holy Spirit showed me afresh just how amazing Jesus is, how beautiful he is, how majestic he is, how kind he is. He's the most extraordinary person who's ever walked on the face of the globe. 
how he lived a life of stunning beauty and died a death of remarkable sacrifice to win me for God. And, and Jesus kind of captured my heart. And then without even trying, something had happened in me because I was connected to vine, so without even trying, I found myself talking about Jesus to my friends. I found myself talking about the fact I went to church with my colleagues. I found myself, without even realizing it, kind of sending a text message to someone and inviting them to Alpha because I was connected to the vine. So you might be here, how do you feel about Jesus? What does Jesus mean to you today? You might say, well, how do I get close to him? Well, I think of Nisaga. Here's, here's a picture of Nisaga. Uh, Nisaga's an architect. Uh, she's, I think, 23 years old. And she had never heard the name Jesus. Never heard it growing up. And then someone came to her and said, would you like to have a Bible? And so she started reading one of the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life in the Bible, which I'd really encourage you to do if you've never done before. And she read it. She thought, this guy is fascinating. This guy is amazing. How can I not have heard of him before? And, and, and then she thought, well, I'd like to explore more. So, so she came along to Alpha at our church. And, 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 and as she kind of was able to chat to people and go on a journey with people over the weeks, she kind of found this faith growing in her life. And she encountered Jesus. I spoke to her on Tuesday night. And she said, Jesus is the most amazing person in my whole life. He's transformed my life. And he's helped me realize I've got this Father in heaven who loves me. I, I just, I don't know how I would have lived without knowing him. So I want to encourage you, if you're here and you'd like to get closer to Jesus, you could try reading his word. Jesus says that if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. If my words remain in you, I'd encourage you, get into his words. Listen to what he says. Give Jesus the opportunity to speak to you tomorrow through his eternal word into the very practical situations you're facing. Never ceases to amaze me how often Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, who inspired these words to be written, can take them and impress them on your heart in a way that changes your day. But you also might want to come along to Alpha on Wednesday in the morning or the evening. Just have an opportunity to say, what do I really feel about Jesus? What do I think about him? You know, reading the Bible changed my life. I, I worked for many years as a, a criminal defense barrister. And so every day for years, I was reading eyewitness evidence about what had happened in the case. And... and over the years, I represented hundreds, probably over a thousand people accused of crimes. It's great some of you have come out today. And, <laughs> but when I read the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection, I suddenly realized, oh, these are true. This is real. And I encountered him through his words. But whatever you do, I'd encourage you, make this a moment where you resolve, I'm going to get closer to Jesus, whatever that looks like. Maybe you want to, the word here, menain, to remain, it means to stay more, to stay. Maybe you just want to write those four letters, stay, S-T-A-Y, just, just on your lock screen on your phone. So when you stay, oh, this is going to be a day when I stay with Jesus. You know, maybe you want to write it on your fridge, stay, or maybe on your mirror, stay. Maybe you want to put it on a post-it note by your laptop at work, just put stay. This is going to be a day at work where I stay in Jesus. Whatever else is happening, you can put quite a few in your workplace, and then you know, your next kind of Salary negotiation, your boss might not take you for granted quite so much because he's thinking, oh, they might leave. They're persuading themselves to stay. <laughs> Make this a moment you resolve to stay and stay close to Jesus. But then the second thing we need to see in this passage is be shaped by Jesus. Jesus says he cuts off every branch in him that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. And Jesus uses this key metaphor of pruning, and it's both hugely encouraging and hugely challenging. One of the things I love about Jesus is that he comforts the disturbed, and he disturbs the comfortable. So if you're here today, and you're hanging on by your fingertips, you're at the end of yourself, you don't know which way to turn, and you know deep down, I desperately, I don't know how I can get through this week without God, 
there's a word of huge encouragement for you today. And if you're here today and you're smashing life, you're hitting home runs for fun, didn't know how it could be so easy. And deep down, you think you don't really need God. There's a word of warning for you here today. If both branches are cut, if one is cut off, the branch that bears no fruit, it only outwardly appears to be connected to the vine, has no real relation, is cut off. I just want to say to you today, don't settle for the outward appearance of a relationship with God. You were made for far more than that. You were made for the reality of a true connection with Jesus. That branch is cut off. But then the branch that's bearing fruit is cut back. And it seems like the reward for following Jesus faithfully, bearing fruit for him, is pruning. Now, if you're pruning, the gardener has to cut back right to the knuckle of the branch. Even the branch that's bearing fruit has to cut back right to the knuckle to prune it. And so if you watch a gardener as they're pruning a plant, it looks like they're attacking the plant. So they say, oh, look, you know, here's here's a branch that's borne a lot of fruit. It seems to be doing very well. Let's cut it back. Oh, there's another one. That seems to have had a good year. It's borne a lot of fruit. Let's cut it back. Oh, there's that one seems to be doing quite well. It's, It's... really been faithful, it's borne a lot of fruit this year. Let's cut it back. And as the gardener prunes the branch, you're left with this ugly thing. (laughs) And it can look like the gardener is punishing the plant, but the gardener's not punishing the plant. The gardener is preparing the plant for even greater fruitfulness. It looks unkind. It looks harsh but it's absolutely essential for the plant to flourish. There are times in life when you're being cut back. There are times in life when God is using whatever you're facing to refine you. And if you misunderstand it, if you don't understand what's going on, you can look at what the gardener's doing. You can look at what seems to be going on. You can look at the pruning and you can think, oh, I I must have upset God. Oh, God must be in some way displeased with me. Oh, God must have abandoned me. I, I must have disappointed God. I, I must be outside of his path for my life, his will for my life. That's why everything seems to be going wrong. But you might be experiencing the very kindness of God in the midst of your pruning. And he's not punishing you. He's preparing you for even greater fruitfulness in the future. Don't misunderstand it. It looks harsh. The the blades are sharp, but the hands that wield them are kind. And they are committed to your flourishing. They want the very best for you. Pruning provides the space for new things to grow in your life. Maybe you've been cut back. Maybe you've been cut back at this moment. It's a relationship that's ended or or something hasn't gone as well as you'd hoped at work or or a friendship's kind of broken down and you feel like things have been taken from you. You feel like things have been cleared away from you. Good things, things you don't want to lose. And it can be confusing. but, But when God prunes you, he's preparing space for new things to grow in your life. Good things, better things. And God can use, it doesn't necessarily send it, But God can use whatever you're facing to prune you. I encourage you, whatever you're facing today, pray. Say to God, God, I don't understand why this is happening, but would you use it to prune me? Would you use it to prepare me for the fruit you want me to bear in the future? In one sense, pruning is the greatest encouragement you can experience in life, painful though it is, because it says God has not given up on you. And God wants to bear more fruit through you, more than you could ask or imagine. And therefore pruning, sometimes pruning is the sign that God has good purposes for your life. Because what does Jesus say here? He says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Jesus tells this whole thing so that you might, his joy might be in you and your joy might be complete, better than it has before, complete, overflowing, full to the brim. There's a joy that's on the other side of the pruning you're facing. Sometimes the joy we long for 
is on the other side of the pruning we resist. Why is it joyful? Because the press is off. Because when you're connected to Jesus and he's cleared the ground, he can bear fruit through you actually without you really trying. We get all of the fun of partnering with God and none of the responsibility. And he wants to bear fruit in your life. I find that so encouraging because I often think I'm not very good actually at bearing fruit. I'm not, not very good at kind of sharing my faith. I'm not, not very good at making the most of every opportunity. It's so encouraging. It actually brings joy to me that even when I'm tired and make mistakes and things don't work out the way I'd want to, Jesus can still be bearing through, through me. A little while ago, I went to a shoe shop in the center of the city and, and the guy who runs the shop was helping me find some shoes. We got chatting and it, it turned out I, I mentioned that I'm involved with church and, and then he kind of paused and, and looked kind of a little bit like he wasn't sure how to respond. And I suddenly realized, I felt the Holy Spirit. I thought, oh, it's almost like Jesus is already here. Jesus is already at work. And, and, and I've, I've just come alongside. And then I, I said to him, oh, I know it sounds strange, but is there someone in your family who's like got faith? And he said, my grandma. And then his eyes kind of filled with tears. He said, my grandma prays for me. And I was walking by that shop a little while later, a few weeks later, and he, he kind of came over and he waved me in. So I thought, I better go in. I went in. And his team were all there. It turns out he's training his team. He kind of brought me in. He said, guys, this is Steve. He's a pastor. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I was like, don't do that. I mean, I like to know people for at least a year before I disclose that because it just, people aren't sure how to deal with it. You know, it's much better, you know, after a year, over coffee, just to say, I go to church. And then, you know. <laughs> and then he says, look, there's a church down the road and you guys can go to it if you want to explore faith. And if you go, Steve will sort you out and he'll help you to explore faith. Isn't that right, Steve? I was like. <laughs> and he said, he said, see, the thing is, guys, we all need someone. I need someone. You need someone. You need someone. You need someone. And he knows someone. He said, come on, Steve, tell him. I was like, tell them what? <laughs> to tell him about the, the things you do. I said, oh, I said, oh, we have like services on a Sunday. He said, yeah, you can go to a service on a Sunday. He said, the other thing. I said, what other thing? He said, the thing, you know, um, in the week, the, the thing where people can come. Alpha, we do Alpha. Yes, we do Alpha. He said, what's, tell him about it. I said, oh, well, you come along and there's like food and then you have like a talk on an interesting aspect of life, faith and meaning and then you can have a little chat with people, you know, no opinion off bounds, no question off limits, and you can just say what you think and hear what other people think, people from all different walks of life. He said, there, you can do that. So guys, go and, go and try his church. <laughs> so I walked out of this shop. I was like, what is going on? <laughs> He's not a church girl. He's not even a Christian yet. He's inviting people to Alpha. <laughs> I find that difficult to do now. <laughs> but if Jesus is at work and bearing fruit, then anything can happen. And he wants to bear fruit through you, wherever he's positioned you, in your workplace, through your friendships, this week. And he's going ahead of us. It, it never occurs to me when I feel that kind of nudge to send someone a text. It never occurs to me that in some ways, the person I'm thinking of sending the text to, uh, they, they, might, they might have been up at night, 2 a.m., thinking, oh, I wish God would send someone to me. You know, I'm thinking about speaking to a colleague at work. It never occurs to me that maybe they've been wondering, what makes Steve so calm in stressful situations? What, what, what could he share with me? It never occurs to me that my you know, slightly awkward obedience to a random nudge might be the answer to someone else's prayer. I wonder what needs pruning in your life at the moment so new things can grow. I'll be honest with you. For me, it's probably my phone. I, I love my phone. I use it all the time, too much actually. But I sometimes think I bought a phone, and then other times I think the phone bought me. Uh, sometimes I think it's a product that I own. Sometimes I think I'm a product that it owns. Sometimes I think I'm using it. Sometimes I think it uses me. I think, actually, it wouldn't be such a bad thing if God just pruned it in some way. 
to provide space for things to grow. I don't know how that... Oh. Um, but then good things can grow in its place. <laughs> you might be here and you might be saying, well, I, I, I'm going through a difficult time. How can I trust the hands of God if I put my trust in him? I tell you, it says in this passage, greater love has no one than this than they lay down their life for their friends. You might be here and you're saying, well, actually, my life is amazing. When you say joy will be complete, are you saying there's like another level of joy? I want to tell you, there definitely is. One day, we'll all come face to face with Jesus. I tell you, on that day, if you know him, you will experience a joy which you would give everything else in your life for. You can trust him. Why? Grace love this. No one this than they lay down their life for their friends. Jesus laid down his life for you. Jesus knows you to the bottom of your soul. All of the good, all of the bad. All that you're proud of and push to the surface and try and impress people with. All that you're ashamed of and try and bury and hide. Jesus knows you to the bottom of your soul and yet he loves you to the sky. And he was willing to give his life, to bear your sins on the cross, to shed his blood so that you might know forgiveness and freedom. And you might be welcomed as a much loved daughter, a much loved son of God so that you might be able to approach God and know that he welcomes you as his child. You can trust him. Look at what it cost him to take hold of you. He's not going to let go of you. And he has good things that he wants to grow in your life. Good fruit. Yes, he might have to clear out some of the branches, but he's doing it for a good purpose. And you can trust him. Get close to Jesus and ask him to prune you so that great fruit can grow in your life. In Jesus' name, amen.